Okay, so uh, we're going to start talking about uh, chapter 11 today in the textbook. So chapter 11 is kind of a, it's not necessarily like a standalone chapter on its own. It's kind of like bringing a lot of things that we've learned already, tying them in together um, in terms of kind of, you know, rehashing all the reactions we've talked about and how we're actually going to want to utilize them in terms of organic chemistry, right? So chapter 11 deals with synthesis. Um, and again, we've kind of mentioned synthesis already. The big overarching goal of synthesis is literally to make whatever type of compound we want from simpler, um, less complex starting materials. Um, and again, this is going to have, I know it's like kind of, you know, when we talk about it in the textbook, we talk about it in class, it maybe doesn't have that large of applicability in your real everyday life. But you have to think that anytime anyone makes a new drug or has a new drug that they want to um, actually put into production, like we have to have a means by which we can synthesize that compound, right? And so that's why organic synthesis is really, really, really big overall in terms of drug discovery um, and drug invention is the fact that, you know, we can think up a lot of different things that we want to make, but actually synthesizing them can be um, quite a, a complex problem, okay? Um, and so we do introduce you to this idea of organic synthesis um, in this chapter, and spe specifically towards the end of the chapter, something called retrosynthesis, which is um, kind of like a, a way to think about these problems in reverse, as opposed to um, just reactants going to products, okay? So I'm gonna review at the beginning of this chapter um, some of the things that we've already learned, we're going to kind of rehash these reactions that you guys should be familiar with um, and how we're going to utilize them in some simple synthesis problems. And then towards the end, we'll get into this concept of retrosynthesis where things get a little bit um, more complex. Okay. Okay. So um, anytime we're dealing with a synthesis, we usually will have or you'll be given um, your starting materials, right? So for example, um, let's say that we have um, a synthesis type problem here. Um, you'll again be given your starting materials, right? So this is your starting compound. Um, and then you'll be shown what your target compound is. What are you trying to produce? So this is your target product, right? And what you guys are responsible for, what you're supposed to be essentially figuring out here is how do we get from here to here, right? What reagents in what order and what things do we need to consider to get from our starting compound to our target product, okay? Okay, so um, some of the more simple type of synthesis type problems have to deal with just one step synthesis. So for example, um, in this problem, we have an alkene, right? And we take that alkene and we make a dihalide. Um, so ideally, you guys are very familiar with your addition reactions, right? Um, if you have an alkene, if you have a pi bond, you can add um, a halogen to that pi bond, right, to make this dihalide. Now, to do that, this is going to be our halogenation reaction, right? We're going to add um, Br2, um, but specifically, this has to be in the presence of a non-nucleophilic solvent, right? So that non-nucleophilic solvent would be something like carbon tetrachloride. Remember, in our addition chapter, right, there was... Um, a different product that we would obtain if we used a nucleophilic solvent, something like water or something similar to water, right? So just keep that in mind. All right, so this is fairly easy, right? It's a one-step problem. All you need to do to take your starting compound and make your target product is just add bromine in the presence of carbon tetrachloride. Overall, this is a nice, easy, just simple addition reaction, okay? Okay, so... Again, to be successful in these types of problems, you guys need to be very familiar with all of the reactions that we've gone over, right? So this is all the addition reactions, this is all the elimination, all the substitution reactions, as well as our alkynes and our um, radical reactions as well, okay? Um, so to kind of just remind you of those, I wanted you guys to do this little practice problem. So ideally, we'd be in class and this would be group work. Um, but in this problem, what I'm wanting you to do is essentially tell me the reagents that would be required for all of these one-step synthesis type problems, right? Where we're taking this guy in the middle. So this is going to be our starting compound. And for each of these, I want to know what reagents are required to take this alkene in the middle and turn it into all of these guys on the outside, okay? Um, 
So anytime there's an arrow, I'm looking for the reagents. And you have to be very specific with respect to um, the numbers of steps, right? If there's a one and a two, you have to list it as a one and a two. Um, you also need to be very specific with respect to the stereochemical as well as the regiochemical outcome, okay? Um, so go ahead and attempt these guys. There is one that I want you to ignore. It's this one up here. This is the oxidative cleavage, cleavage reaction. It requires ozone, and we never covered this, so just ignore um, this problem, okay? But all the other ones, you should be able to provide me reagents that are going to take that middle guy and make all the guys on the outside. Ideally, you should be also able to provide me reagents that are going to transform each of these two molecules into my, um, my middle molecule. So go ahead and give us a problem or give us a try and then come back and I'll go over the answers for each. Okay, so we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and start on these guys. So I'm going to start up here. I'll say this guy is number one. So we're taking our um, alkene in the middle here and we're trying to make this um, halogenated product, right? So again, all of these guys in the, in the middle are these various formulations of all of our addition reactions, right? Um, and this first one, what they've done is they've taken that pi bond and they've added a bromine, right? Um, and they've also added a implied hydrogen over here, okay? So we have an implied brom or a bromine and then an implied hydrogen. Specifically, we're adding HBr, right? So if you guys remember, this is our hydrohalogenation reaction. This is the first addition reaction that we learned. Um, the problem with this one, though, is that bromine goes to the least substituted position. So if you guys remember, um, on this alkene, on this double bond, we had the most substituted and the least substituted. Bromine here goes to the least substituted position, so this is what we would call anti-Markovnikov addition. And there was a very specific reagent that was going to give us anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation, right? So one of the reagents, I'll go ahead and twist this guy, is HBr, right? But this had to be for anti-Markovnikov, this had to be in the presence of peroxides. So, again, this doesn't have to be a one and a two. These guys are essentially mixed together. That's why we list them together. Um, you could say HBr, everyone over the line, and then R, oops, hold on. You could say HBr, R, O, O, R, together. I always just put one on top, one on bottom, because that's just, like, this is what I like to do, okay? All right, so then as we move on, so the next one, very similar, right? We're adding a bromine to one of the sides of the double bond. And again, we're adding an implied hydrogen to the other. Um, so again, we're adding HBr. Now this one puts the bromine at the more substituted position in the alkene. So this is Markovnikov addition. So for Markovnikov addition, we don't need those peroxides. All we need is just the HBr. Okay, so we're skipping the oxidative cleavage reaction. We're going to go for this guy where we take our alkene, and this is the product, right? So again, we're noting, what are we adding, right? We're adding to that double bond an OH and an OH, right? So if you guys remember, which hopefully you do, this is a dihydroxylation, dihydroxylation reaction. But there is a stereochemical outcome, right? Because whenever we put this OH at both of these carbons on the pi bond of the alkene, right, we're producing two new chirality centers. When these OHs get added, they end up both being um, on the same side of that double bond, right? So both being on the wedge coming out at us. So when these guys got added, this is what we would have called syn addition. Right? Both of them get added to the same side of the double bond. Um, so there was a very specific set of reagents that were going to give us syn dihydroxylation. Specifically, that was that osmium tetraoxide. This is catalytic 
in the presence of in mo right and so you may say where did you get that from well again this goes back to chapter eight which dealt with the addition reactions i would go back through um kind of like the summaries of that chapter just to kind of get a, a a better idea of the reagents that you guys are going to need to know moving forward in this okay okay so then as we move down we see again in our next one we have also added an oh and an oh there is a different stereochemical outcome to this one though right so the OH is here, one of them's on the wedge, one of them's on the dash. So one of them's going down, one of them's coming out. Um, essentially what's happened here, they haven't gotten added to the same side, but instead they've gotten added to different sides. So this is anti-dihydroxylation. There was a different set of reagents that were going to essentially allow us to do that, right? So this was... Um, the uh, peroxy acid, right? So this underwent some sort of um, epoxide intermediate, right? And epoxide um, is a cyclic ether. To do that, again, we needed that peroxy acid. We gave you guys a few of them um, to use, but I just said, you know, go ahead and just remember one. And the one that I told you guys to remember, which we did give you the structure of, was that MCPBA, right? So this is the um, peroxy acid that's going to form the epoxide. Once the epoxide is formed, then to open that, to break open that three-membered cyclic ether structure, we utilize acid to do that. Um, that's ugly. So I'm going to redraw that. So again, for this guy, oops, darn it, there was my NMO. So for this guy, again, we've got um, the uh, peroxy acid, the MCPBA, so MCPBA, and then to open that ring, we also had to have this in the presence of acid, and that gave us our anti-dihydroxylation product. Okay, so moving on, we've got alkene being converted into an OH and then a BR. So again, hopefully this rings a bell. This is that uh, halohydrin product, which is what happened if you had our BR2, right, which is the, the basics of that halogenation reaction, but if you put that in the presence of a nucleophilic solvent, specifically water in this case, because we get the OH, then that OH or that water was going to attack um, the bromonium ion, and essentially we get our halohydrin product as opposed to the um, halogenation product, right, the dihalide um, which is what we would have wanted if we just wanted the halogenation product. Okay, and so for both the halohydrin as well as the um, dihalide, the halo, not halohydrin, so many words. Okay, for both the halohydrin product as well as the halogenation product, um, the addition here was anti. And we went through um, the reason why that was. We went through this bromonium ion intermediate to be attacked. It had to come from behind. Um, and so that's why we got this anti-product um, for both of these guys. So now for this guy, um, we have an alkene. We're going to a dihalide now to the dibromide. Um, so this is what happens if you put bromine in the presence of our non-nucleophilic solvent like carbon tetrachloride. Okay, so then finally we have an alkene. Um, it appears like it's been taken from an alkene to an alkane. Again, what's been added here is hydrogen, right? This is a reduction reaction. This is our hydrogenation reaction. All you need to do for that is hydrogen in the presence of platinum or any type of metal catalyst. And then that can be palladium. There's other stuff that you can use. Um, and then finally, we have these two down here. These guys, we're taking that alkene, we're adding an OH, and we're also adding an H at each carbon, right? So we're adding an H and an OH, so we're adding water. Both of these are hydration reactions. The only way they differ is the regiochemistry. So in the first one, the OH goes to the least substituted position. So this is our anti Markovnikov product, whereas in the second one, the OH goes to the more substituted. This is our Markovnikov product. For anti-Markovnikov hydration, we only had one means to do that, and that was our hydroboration oxidation. 
So in hydroboration oxidation, our first step specifically is BH3 in the presence of THF. And then in a second step, we had to use that oxidation. So hydrogen peroxide, hold on, this is getting, they're getting too close together. Hydrogen peroxide. Um, in the presence of sodium hydroxide, and then I'll put H2 platinum here. So that was our only means by which we could uh, hydrate anything in an anti-Markovnikov fashion. And then for our Markovnikov hydration, um, again, we had we had two options. We had acid catalyzed, and then we had um, the oxymercuration, demercuration. We told you not really to use acid catalyzed, even though you could here, um, due to the fact that they could... Uh, rearrange if rearrangement led to a more stable carbocation. Um, this really isn't the case, but we'll go ahead and still do the oxymercuration. So in that one, we had first up that mercuric acetate in water. And then in that second step, we had the sodium borohydride that was going to reduce off the mercurinium ion. Okay, so that was all of the addition, guys, going around that circle. Um, hopefully, you guys should be able to fill in these two as well, right? So if we have an alkene and we're coming from a halogen, remember, halogens are good leaving groups, right? So overall, um, this is an elimination reaction, right? So we have our alpha carbon. We have two options for beta here, or three options, but two of them are the same. So we have beta hydrogens here, beta hydrogens here. Specifically, we want the double bond to form between these two, right? So if we go back to our elimination terminology, that would be giving us the um, Zayetsev product, the more substituted alkene. To promote that, we're going to utilize um, a non-sterically hindered small base, right? So that would be something very easy, something like Naomi, sodium ethoxide, or... Um, sodium ethoxide or, or yeah, that's usually pretty much the good ones to go by. Um, and then finally, this one, hopefully you guys have picked up on, on this last chapter. How do we take an alkane and make a, um, an alkyl halide? So we only have one reaction at this point that can introduce a functional group. And that is our new radical reaction where we have bromine. In the presence of light, again, the radical reaction takes place and the bromine ends up at the more substituted position, which ends up being what would have been that tertiary radical right here. Okay, so hopefully you guys got the majority of those. If you didn't, you're not going to be successful. Oh, well, you will be successful, but... Um, with respect to this chapter and being successful at synthesis, you have to have a good handle on all of the reactions that we have learned thus far, right? So again, as you're going through this chapter, it may be helpful to keep something like this with you so you can kind of just remind yourself of these various reagents um, and their regiochemical and stereochemical outcome. But you're going to need to have these. You're going to need to be in your mind as we move forward. All right, uh, so those were uh, single step synthesis. Again, those are reactions where you have your starting material, you have your target product, and we do have a means by which in one single step, in one single reaction, we can convert the starting material into our target product, okay? Now, um, we're gonna move into more multi-step problems, and this is really where uh, synthesis gets um, headed to, and the fact that usually with, with most um, things that we want to make, uh, we're not going to be able to have a, a single reaction that's going to accomplish whatever transformation we need in one step, right? So for example, let's say that we had um, a reactant like this guy, right? So this again is our starting material. And we wanted to make um, this guy over here. So this is our target product. 
Okay, so if we look at this, we'll notice, okay, you know, all that's really happened here is bromine has gone from the 2 position to the 3 position, right? Now, in a single step, we do not have a reaction that can just pick that bromine up and move it, right? We don't have a reaction that could take this guy to this guy in one single step. What we do have, though, and this is what we talked about, what has essentially happened in this reaction is we have um, transformed a functional group, but we have moved a functional group, right? And so we talked about, um, especially after the addition reactions, how we could move a functional group in a molecule by first um, undergoing an elimination reaction, right? Um, and then following that with an addition reaction, okay? Now, in this situation, right, if we have um, our starting material, it has a functional group. It has moved positions. And the first step we do is an elimination um, to give the correct reagents for that elimination reaction. We have to notice um, where we need the double bond to go, right? So, for example, here, because the bromine goes over here, that double bond needs to be formed between carbon 2 and carbon 3, right? If the double bond instead formed between carbon 1 and carbon 2, then our overall product at the end of this wouldn't be what we're looking for. It would instead be something that looked like this, right? Or something similar or the exact same material that we would have gotten um, or that we would have started with, right? So we have to be specific on how we eliminate our bromine so that we do get our target product at the end so that we actually do form the double bond in between carbon two and carbon three, okay? So now the difference between um, this guy and the other option, which is this guy as an alkene, um, depends on what type of base we use, right? So for this guy, this would be our Hoffman product. So this would be our Hoffman product, and we could promote the Hoffman product if we needed to. Um, for this guy, though, this would be our Zayetsev product. Zayetsev product, right? So again, who do we need or what type of base do we need to promote the Zayetsev product over the Hoffman? Well, we need something that's small and non-sterically hindered. So this would be something like um, a Naomi. Oops, it's right correctly. So this would be something like Naomi or sodium methoxide or something like that. Um, and then after we get the correct eliminated product, right, so that we can move forward um, and get our target product at the end, we also need to be aware of where the bromine and what else is being added to this double bond, right? So um, in this overall addition reaction, we're adding an H and a BR, and we're adding an H and a BR in a Markovnikov fashion, right, because the bromine is going to the more substituted carbon um, on the alkene. Um, and so for Markovnikov addition, that is specific with respect to HBr, all we have to do is add HBr. If we wanted anti-Markovnikov, that would be HBr in the presence of peroxide, right? So long term, to take this guy and make this guy, it's a two-step process. The first one is going to be our elimination, so we dried out sodium methoxide, that would be one step, right? We would do that reaction, we would purify the product, and then we take that product in our second step of this reaction where we would add HBr um, to it, okay? So anytime you have a separate, separate, uh, separate reaction, you have to list that in terms of numbers. Numbers is literally saying, we do this reaction, we take the product, we purify it, we work it up, and then we move forward with that product, okay? If I had added sodium methoxide to HBr in just one uh, fell swoop or just one big pot, they would essentially just react because, again, we have a base with an acid. Um, all they would do is neutralize one another, and we wouldn't get any type of reaction that we actually wanted, okay? Okay, so again, that was transformation of a functional group, moving a functional group, okay? Now, what if I had something like this? And we talked about this very briefly um, so I'm going to rehash this again just to kind of remind you guys. Um, for this one, we see the exact same thing. Our functional group here is an alcohol. Um, and going from our starting material to our target product, all we've really done is moved that alcohol from carbon 2 to carbon 1. So again, we're moving a functional group, okay? So you would like to think, well, all we need to do is have this undergo, again, an elimination reaction, 
right? So an elimination reaction to produce, um, at this point in time, we'd want the, the Hoffman product, right? So we would want this as our double bond. And then we would want this to undergo an addition reaction, right? And the addition would be the addition of H and OH. So we'd be adding water. This would be a hydration. And this would be a hydration in a anti-Markovnikov fashion because the OH is going to the least substituted position, right? Now, the only problem with this is this first step, this elimination reaction, right? Because if you guys remember, alcohols are bad leaving groups, right? And so because of that, um, they don't leave on their own, right? So we did have a couple means to deal with this. The first one we could have said was our acid catalyzed elimination, right? So if we had added acid that would have turned the alcohol into water, which is a good leaving group. It would have leave, it would have left. But the problem with that is that um, acid catalyzed elimination is an E1 process, right? So remember elimination unimolecular um, in E1 elimination reactions. There's no way to control for the regiochemical outcome. You always get the Zayetsev product, right? So for this reaction, we couldn't use um, acid to turn that into a good leaving group because we would have gotten the product that we don't want, right? We need the, um, this is Zayetsev. We need the Hoffman product so that we can move our alcohol to the correct carbon, okay? Um, so we can't do that, right? So we can just cross this guy out. We can't do this guy. Um, so how do we take OH and make it a good leaving group so that it actually can undergo this E2 reaction where we can control the regiochemistry? So this is when we introduce you that idea of um, a substitution reaction, right? So what's going to happen here, I'm going to draw a big arrow going down, is we're going to turn that OH, that alcohol, into a tosylate, right? So um, tosylate's a really, really good leaving group. To do that, we're going to use uh, tosyl chloride in the presence of pyridine, right? So this is, and that, that's a comma. I should note that. This may be confusing. This is a comma. We don't need that. So tosyl chloride and pyridine, that's going to turn that alcohol into a tosylate. So it looks something like this. This is an OTS. That is a very good leaving group, right? So now it can undergo an E2 reaction. So specifically, since we want the Hoffman product, the reaction to produce that Hoffman product is going to depend on the type of base that we use. Um, so if we want our Hoffman product here, we're going to need to use a bulky, sterically hindered base. So this would be something like um, tert butoxide. So T -bu OK. That would give us our Hoffman product. And then once we have our Hoffman product, we can then hydrate it um, in, in an anti-Markovnikov fashion. So in an anti-Markovnikov fashion, hydration reaction, we only have one. It's the um, hydroboration oxidation. So this is BH3THF and then H2O2, H2O2 and in a OH. Okay, so long term, if it is an alcohol and we're transforming an alcohol, instead of it just being an elimination followed by um, an addition, it would instead be a substitution to turn that alcohol into um, the, tosyl the tosylate, which is a good leaving group. That would then be eliminated, um, and then we would add water um, via our addition, right? So if we listed this, because long term, usually with these guys, we will list these. Um, our first reaction here would be TSCL in pyridine. Our second reaction would then be the elimination. We would have tert bu OK. Um, and then that hydroboration has two separate reactions of its own. First one is the BH3 in THF. And then the last one is the oxidation part. H2O2 in NaOH. So it's helpful to kind of list everything um, over the overall arrow and taking our starting material and making our target product.
Okay, so then the other type of pattern that we introduced you guys to after um, we talked about the addition reaction um, was what happens if we want to change the position of a pi bond, right? So for example, um, in this problem, they're saying, okay, we have a pi bond here on our um, cyclohexene ring. Um, we want to move it here, right? So again, in a simple one-step fashion, we don't have a means by which we can just pick up that pi bond and move it, right? Instead, this is going to have to undergo some sort of multi-step multi synthesis, right? And we talked about um, essentially how we could do that, right? This could be um, an addition reaction, right? So for this guy, specifically the addition would be um, putting a nice little um, functional group or very good leaving group um, at this carbon, right? And so a good leaving group would be something like bromine. So we could have our hydrohalogenation reaction. Again, um, for this guy, if we wanted to put a bromine there, um, we would specifically be looking for the Markovnikov product, right? So if we wanted to put the bromine at the more substituted position, the hydrogen at the least substituted position, this is Markovnikov addition, so all we need to do is have HBr. And then once we've added to that double bond, we could then re-eliminate, right? So um, anytime we want to move the position of a pi bond, it's usually an addition reaction followed by an elimination reaction. Um, and for elimination, again, um, we specifically want the Hoffman product at this point. If we eliminated and got the Zayetsev product, we would essentially just reform uh, what we initially started with, which is not what we want. Um, this would be the Zayetsev. So specifically, we're looking for the Hoffman product. We can produce the Hoffman product in a large proportion by using the suitable base, which again is going to be a bulky sterically hindered base, something like um, terpetoxide. Right, so terpetoxide would give us our Hoffman product, which is the overall product that we want. Right, so change the position of a double bond. It's an addition reaction followed by an elimination. When you add, you're going to want to add a good leaving group, right? There's no point to add water at this point because then you would have to, um, you know, add another reaction to uh, re-eliminate that water. That's silly. Just add HBr put on a good leaving group, um, and then eliminate that leaving group via whatever base you need to get the, the appropriate eliminated product as a result. So here, if we wanted to just summarize this, this is HBr. Uh, reaction occurs, you work up the product, it's going to be followed by T, B, U, OK. OK, so again, this is stuff that we've all rehashed, right? We've talked about moving the position of a functional group. We've talked about uh, moving the position of a pi bond. So now, something that's new um, that we haven't really quite, like, um, I guess, melded into our idea of synthesis is how to introduce a functional group, right? So thus far, we haven't been able to take, let's say, an alkane and introduce functionality to it, right? We don't have a means by which we could take an alkane and make a double bond on its own. We have a means by which we could take an alkane and introduce a functional group like um, an alcohol or anything like that, okay? Now, last chapter, our radical reactions chapter, we did learn how to introduce um, specifically bromine into an alkane, right? And so... To do this, this is going to be um, that radical bromination reaction, right? Um, so radical reactions, we introduced last chapter. Um, in radical bromination, we need uh, bromine in the presence of our energy source, which is H nu, which is light, right? And we know that bromine, that radical bromination, um, it was very selective in where the bromine actually attached, right? As opposed to the chlorination which was not as selective. So the more stable um, radical was gonna lead to where um, we actually saw um, bromine attach, right? And so for this re reaction, um, we had a couple of different, we could have a couple of different options, right? We could have a primary radical here, a secondary radical. Um, the more stable radical though is gonna be this tertiary radical, and that's where we're actually gonna see um, our bromine attach, right? And so um, overall for this, this is our way that we're gonna introduce a new functional group um, this radical bromination. 
Another thing that is new is actually um, being able to increase a carbon skeleton. So before we talked about our alkyne chapter, our carbon-carbon triple bond, we didn't have a means by which we could um, create carbon-carbon bonds. So we didn't have a means by which we could extend a carbon skeleton, right? But now we do, right? So anytime we have a terminal alkyne, and again, this is coming from chapter nine, our alkynes reaction. Anytime we have a terminal alkyne, alkyne, right, where we have this nice hydrogen that is fairly acidic and can be deprotonated. Um, if we take that terminal alkyne and we put it in the presence of a very strong base, so something like this guy, our sodium amide. So the sodium amide, the NH2, is the base part of it. It will deprotonate that terminal alkyne and produce our alkanide ion, right? So we have our negative charge carbon here. This is our alkanide ion. This guy is therefore a really strong nucleophile. So a strong nucleophile. So if we nucleophile. So if we put this in the presence of some sort of um, primary alkyl halide, something like, let's say, um, ethyl iodide, right? So this is our EI. This is our ethyl iodide. This guy will act as a strong nucleophile. It will attack um, our alpha carbon, pushing off of this nice leaving group, this nice um, halogen, and overall our product is going to be the creation of that carbon-carbon bond. Um, again, we have a 1-2-3 carbon chain that's attaching to a 1-2 carbon chain. This is a 1-2-3-4-5 carbons overall. And again, this strong nucleophile, this is an SN2 reaction. So a nucleophilic attack followed by loss of leaving group occurs in one step, and we get the creation of our carbon-carbon bond, right? So this is the only way at this point in time that we can extend um, our molecule, extend the carbon-carbon chain. Okay, so we're going to kind of take all of this together, right? So um, before we start talking about retrosynthesis, we're going to continue to kind of move in this forward direction where we're going to be looking at our um, starting material, we're going to be looking at our um, target material. And we're going to imagine how we can go from our starting material to our target material, keeping in mind now that we can introduce functionality into molecules that don't have any functionality. We can um, extend a carbon chain, and we can also um, change the position of both functional groups as well as um, pi bonds. Okay. Um, so now, as we go about this, I want you to keep two things in mind. First off, the question I want you to ask is, um, is there a change in the carbon skeleton, right? So number one, have we um, increased the number of carbons overall? That's what we mean by change in the carbon, carbon skeleton. And then number two, is there a change in the functional group? And there are two parts to that question, right? Is there a change in the identity of the functional group? And is there a change in the, the location of the functional group, right? So for this example, right, if I ask myself that first question, is there a change in the carbon skeleton in going from our starting material to our target product? So our idealized product, the thing I'm going to do to answer that question is I'm going to count carbons, right? So I say we have right now we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we have five carbons in our starting material. And in our target product, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we have seven carbons, right? So yes, the answer to that is we have changed the carbon skeleton. Specifically, we have increased our chain by two carbons. All right, so then I'm also going to ask, what about the functional group, right? So in our starting molecule, our functional group is an alkyne, right? So our starting functional group is an alkyne. In our target product, that has changed identity, right? Now our functional group here is an alkene. So yes to change in identity, let me write this to yes to change in identity. 
But then in terms of position, if we count carbons here, we have one, one, two, three, four, five. So we have the triple bond between four and five. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, and then it extends on. So this would be no two location. It hasn't necessarily changed location in the molecule. Okay, so that's the first thing, right? If we increase the carbon chain, we know that we're going to need that um, that alkyne reaction. And I didn't mention this last problem. That is called alkylation. Sometimes I remember the right words and sometimes I don't. So we will need this alkylation reaction. What's nice about our starting material is that this is a terminal alkyne. So we could potentially directly... Um, undergo that alkylation reaction because it is a terminal alkyne. And then um, we'll talk about number two once we actually deal with number one. So first off, um, we need to increase our carbon chain by two carbons. We are dealing with a terminal alkyne. Um, and so all we really needed to do in this first step is we need to first off deprotonate that terminal alkyne. So number one, we're going to use that um, strong base sodium amide that's gonna produce the alkanide ion. And we need to increase that carbon chain by two carbons, right? So we already have five, we need two. So we're gonna have that alkanide ion react with something like ethyl iodide, right? Which would look something like this. We have our iodide with our one, two carbon. If we had our terminal alkyne, it was deprotonated, it would look something like this. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? This guy's going to attack here. We get loss of leaving group. And overall, as our product for this guy, we would get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. So we have, wait, make sure I got that right. Yeah. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes. Okay. Now, in terms of things that you need to show for this, right, um, all I would be looking for is this guy and then probably the product over here. You don't need to show um, any type of mechanism, right, which is what I've kind of drawn over here. And the only reason why I drew the mechanism is to kind of get you an idea of, like, what's actually happening in this reaction. We have this nucleophilic attack from this um, terminal alkyne on, on this two-carbon alkyl halide, Okay. So again, we have, if we can go ahead and make another arrow. We have, this is our starting material. We've reacted with sodium amide and ethyl iodide, and we now have our seven carbon alkyne. So this is our seven carbon alkyne. Now we'll move into well, what happens in terms of uh, taking an alkyne that is seven carbons long. So we're done dealing with extending the carbon chain and changing the identity of that alkyne to an alkene, right? So all we need to do at this point is take our alkyne and turn it into an alkene because the position of this guy and this guy is exactly the same. We don't need to move that pi bond. We just need to change its actual identity, okay? So then the question is, okay, do we have any reactions that can take an alkyne and turn it into an alkene? Um, and let's say that we had an alkyne that looked like this, just as a reminder. The answer to that is yes, right? We do have um, two reactions specifically. So the first one is going to take an alkyne and turn it into a cis alkene, Right, and the second one was going to take an alkyne and turn it into the trans alkene. Right, and so we had different reagents. So this is our cis alkene, this is our trans alkene. We had different reagents depending on what product we wanted to get. Did we want the cis alkene or do we want the trans alkene? And so when we look up at our target product, we'll notice that this specifically is a trans alkene. Again, we're comparing the hydrogens here, right? They're on opposite sides, so this is the transalkene. To take an alkyne and turn it into the transalkene, that was specifically that dissolving metal reduction, right? So this was um, sodium metal in the presence of liquid ammonia. So if we did that, we have sodium metal in the presence of 
liquid ammonia that would give us our overall transalkene product. Now for the cisalkene, this is just as a, as a brief reminder, as a refresher, um, the cisalkene was hydrogen, um, but then we need to use hydrogen in the presence of a poison catalyst. This was uh, Lind, man, I'm not, not moving good today. This was Lindlar's catalyst. And that would give you the cisalkene. Okay, so overall, again, two questions. Do we change the carbon skeleton? The answer to that was yes. We were going to increase something by two carbons. Um, number two, do we change the functional group? Function all group. Um, the answer to that was yes, we changed the identity, but no, we did not change the location. Um, and kind of informing us and in going about this overall synthesis was the fact that we started with a terminal alkyne, so we could immediately use that alkylation reaction to add two carbons. Once we did that, all we needed to do was figure out how to, how to change that, um, that functional group, the alkyne, and turn it into the transalkene, um, and we have a reaction to do that, right? So essentially, this was also just a two-step problem. If we were going to go ahead and collect our, um, our reagents over the arrow for all of the steps in the overall synthesis, we would first list our um, sodium amide. Right? And remember, in this alkylation reaction, these guys had to be um, in two separate steps. If we had put that amide in the presence of um, this primary um, alkyl halide, we would have also gotten elimination products, which is not what we want. Um, so we deprotonate our alkyne in the first step. Then we're going to add that deprotonated alkyne to our, um, our alkyl halide, our ethyl iodide. Again, you could write that like that, or you could also draw out the actual structure of the molecule. So that got us to here, and then in that final step, all we needed was the dissolving metal reduction. So sodium in the presence of liquid ammonia. Okay, and so again, two different questions. Are we changing the carbon skeleton? Like, are we increasing it? And then are we changing the identity or the location of the functional group? All right, so go ahead and try these guys. They're kind of similar to what we just saw. Um, so I want to know the reagents needed. So what we would call this is the total synthesis or the synthesis for um, taking uh, both of these guys' as starting material and turning it into the target products over here. Um, so go ahead and give this guy a shot, asking those same two questions that we just went over, extending the carbon skeleton, changing the identity and location of the functional group, um, and then come back and we'll talk about what the answers are to these two. Okay, so I'm gonna move A down below. We're gonna go over that one first, and then I'll start on B. Um, I think I want to actually copy paste. To give myself some room. Okay, so we'll talk, start talking about A first, okay? Now, again, um, for A, we have our starting material. We have our target product. And the first question we're going to ask is, do we extend the carbon chain, right? So does the carbon chain get longer? And for this guy, we go through and we'd say, okay, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we have five carbons as our starting material. And then if we go to the product, we'll find we have one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons, eight carbons as our target product. Okay. So yes, the answer to that is number one, do we extend the carbon chain? Yes. And we extend it by three carbons. Number two, what happens with respect to the functional group? So we take an alkyne and we turn it into an alkene. So we do change the identity, yes, to identity. But in terms of location, we have um, one, two, three, four, five. And over here we have one, two, three, four, five. So the functional group is still between carbons four and five, so it doesn't change its location. So no to location. 
Okay, so again, this is very similar to the, to the practice problem that we just did. We start over here with a terminal alkyne, right? And we know that we need to extend the carbon chain. So we know that we have to undergo um, that alkylation reaction. Alkylation reaction, right? So again, we're going to take this guy first. We're going to deprotonate it. And we're going to add it to an alkyl halide with whatever carbons we actually need to extend that chain, right? So the first thing we're going to do is deprotonate it. We're going to use that sodium amide to do that. That's going to give us our alkynide ion, which is a nice strong nucleophile. Now we need to extend it one, two, three carbons. So as opposed to ethyl iodide, we'll now be reacting it with a propyl iodide, right? So we would have this guy, it would come up and we'd have an iodide and one, two, three, one, two, three carbons. Again, it would attack the alpha carbon. We'd lose the leaving group and our overall product here would be our triple bond to this guy, to this guy. So we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We had one, two, three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight. And that's what we need overall, okay? Um, so again, you can write that a couple of different ways. You can draw it out as the structure, right? So you could say, oh, it's this that we're reacting it with. Or you could just also say uh, propyl iodide. Okay, so that extends our chain, right? So we've done that, right? So now the question is, well, how do we take our alkyne that we still have with our eight carbons now and we turn it into our alkene? Um, so again, we just talked about how there are two possible ways to do that, um, depending on the type of alkene that you want. What type of alkene do we need here, though? We have hydrogen, we have hydrogen, um, the same side of the double bond, so this is the cis alkene that we actually want to produce. That is not going to be the dissolving metal reduction, but that instead will be the poison catalyst. So this guy would be hydrogen in the presence of Lindlar's catalyst. Um, again, that's our poison catalyst that we would use for our cis um, alkene production. All right, so then if we wanted to, again, summarize all that, our first step is sodium amide. Our second step is this propyl iodide. Our third step is our dissolving, not dissolving, our poison catalyst, hydrogen, and Lindlar's catalyst. Okay, so that is nice. It's kind of, it's not simple, but uh, we've seen an example like that already. Um, so then for B, I'm going to go ahead and get and copy B so I have more room, and we'll move B out here. Oops, didn't want to do that. Um, un momento, por favor. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about B, because B is a little bit more difficult. So hopefully you guys have given B a shot. Um, this is going to be not, again, something that we've seen, because we've only really seen two example problems. Um, but I want you to go ahead and analyze this the exact same way, right? So the first question that we're asking here is, are we extending the carbon chain? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, so as a note, I only look at the parent chain. I don't, for right now, I'm going to ignore our substituents here. And the parent chain for this guy has one, two, three, four carbons, right? So we have a four carbon parent chain. As we move over to the product, again, I'm going to ignore these, these two substituents. We find that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So um, the answer to question one, have we extended the carbon chain? The answer to that is yes, and specifically by three carbons we've added. Number two, have we changed the functional group? Um, and so in our starting material, our functional group is an alkene. So we have an alkene. Uh, we're actually keeping an alkene. It is also an alkene here. So we're not changing the identity, but we are changing the location, right? So we have one, two, three, four. We have the alkene between carbon three and four in our starting material, whereas here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Our alkene is between carbons five and six. 
So we are changing the location. So no to identity and yes to location. Okay, so now there's a couple of things uh, to keep in mind here, okay? Number one, we are changing the carbon chain, right? So we are going to have to undergo, um, again, an alkylation reaction at some point in time, right? Now, um, there would be some tendency to say, okay, I'm going to take my starting material and I'm going to undergo the alkylation reaction with it, right? Um, to do that, you would need to take an alkene and turn it into an alkyne, and we can do that. There's a way that we can go about doing that. Um, but then with that alkyne, you would have to react that. It would be a terminal alkyne with um, some sort of propyl iodide or, yeah, some sort of three-carbon um, alkyl halide. And that would give you an alkyne in, or one, two, th this is carbon three and four. So this would give you something that looked like this, like this like this, right? So this would give you long-term something that had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, the problem with this would be, okay, well, then we can take this and we could turn it into this. But then to do that, because it's changed positions, we would have to undergo um, an addition reaction or we'd have to undergo a uh, reduction to the alkene and then we'd have to do this and we'd have to do that. So there would be a lot, a lot of steps involved if we try to turn this alkene into an alkyne and then undergo that alkylation reaction that way, okay? With respect to synthesis, there are wrong answers in things that become too complex and too many steps to actually be um, an efficient synthesis, okay? So because of that, I'm not gonna go that route. It's gonna take too many steps and it's not gonna be efficient overall. Instead, what I'm gonna say is, okay, we know we're extending the chain, we know we have to undergo the alkylation, um, but we're also moving the functional group essentially over carbon. So perhaps the thing that attacks the actual um, deprotonated alkanide ion, perhaps that's going to be the thing that is reacting with our starting material, right? So our starting material would be the alkyl halide, would be the um, substrate in that alkylation reaction, and the nucleophile would be something that we would add in right, the um, deprotonated alkanide ion, okay? So if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to take this alkene and I wanted to make it a nice alkyl halide with a good leaving group at this um, last carbon that could then be attacked by a nucleophile, a good leaving group would be something like a bromine, right? So we'd maybe want to attach a bromine here. We'd maybe want to attach a hydrogen here. So the first step for me would be undergoing that addition reaction, right? So I would have an addition reaction where I would take this alkene and I would add HBr across the double bond. So this would be a hydrohalogenation reaction. Um, to get the bromine at that carbon-4, though, this needs to be in an anti-Markovnikov fashion because, again, I want this carbon-4 to be the thing that the alpha carbon, the thing that gets attacked in that substitution reaction. Um, so to put bromine there, we also need this in the presence of peroxides because, again, this is our anti-Markovnikov uh, product, anti-Mark. Okay, so once we have that guy, that's our first step, HBr in the presence of peroxides. We get that anti-Markovnikov uh, hydro halogen product, um, we're then going to take that and we're going to react it with a deprotonated alkanide with however many carbons we need, right? So we needed to add three carbons. So this guy is going to be carbon, what is this, pro propanide, this propanide ion. So propanide, again, I'm getting that from it's three carbons, and it's that deprotonated alkyne, so it's what we call a propanide ion. Um, and again, this doesn't come just by itself. It is, an, it is an anion. It's a negative charge ion. So usually this would be like something like a sodium propanide. So the way you could write this would be NaCl. 
H2CH3. So now this guy is going to act as the um, nucleophile. It's going to attack our alpha carbon, which is going to push this guy out. Um, we have our leaving group leave. And then as a result of that, we're going to end up with four going to five to six to seven. Right, and so again, you want to try to count carbons to keep track of all of these. We've got a one, a two, a three, a four. We've got one, two, three, four. The new bond is being formed between four and five, right? So this is our five, this is our five, this is our six, this is our six, and then this guy is our seven. And then again, you're saying, oh, what happened to these two? I'm just ignoring them for right now. They're still there. Okay, so um, that would be the propanide ion. You would just add that in. We would get our seven carbon chain at that point in time. And note, because that propanide attacked, the functional group changed to now being between carbons five and six because it attacked carbon four, right? And so that's exactly where we need the new functional group, except the new functional group is not the alkyne, that we have right now, the new functional group is the alkene, and most specifically, it is the transalkene. So now to take an alkyne and get the transalkene, we need to use the dissolving metal reduction. So this is sodium metal in the presence of liquid ammonia. Okay, so this reaction overall has three separate steps. The first step is our anti-Markovnikov uh, hydrohalogenation. So we have HBr in the presence of peroxides. In the second step, once we have our uh, primary alkyl halide here, then we're going to attack that with our propanide ion, right? So this is our uh, terminal alkyne that has been deprotonated. It's going to act as nucleophile, forming a bond between carbon 4 now and then our new carbon 5, and that's this bond right here. Um, it also is attaching three carbons to that chain. The um, new triple bond, or the triple bond that's still there, it's still present, is between carbon 5 and 6, and so we see that. And now to change that triple bond into a double bond, and specifically a trans double bond, um, we're just going to use that dissolving metal reduction. So we had HBr in the presence of peroxides. We had um, that propanide. So NaCCH2CH3. And then we had three sodium metal in liquid ammonia. Okay, so that one's a little bit, a little bit more difficult. But again, keeping in mind... You know you have to undergo alkylation if you extend the carbon chain. And in this problem, the big key for me was the fact that that uh, functional group position moved, right? And so it told me that I had to have my um, starting material become the thing that got attacked was the fact that we moved the double bond between carbons 3 and 4 to carbons 4 and 5. So the thing that was attacking was going to essentially be the thing that held the functional group that we were going to manipulate later on. Okay, so again, with respect to uh, synthesis, the best way to go about doing this is practicing and practicing and practicing. So I'm going to, I mean, obviously open up the homework for this. Um, but at this point, if you're saying, I don't get it, this is not making sense, I would, I would start doing practice problems. Oh, don't do that. I would go and start doing practice problems as much as possible. Um, and that's what's really good, at least about having Wiley Plus as our learning management system is the fact that, you know, they'll, they're going to give you feedback immediately. So if you're not doing something correctly, um, they're going to tell you specifically that you're not. Um, and then if you're still confused by it or you're confused that you're not putting it in correctly, just go ahead and email me and ask me questions. Take a screenshot and show me what you're putting in and I can hopefully help you um, figure out how, how to correct any type of mistakes that you have.